Should we sing t- in? <laughs> um, <laughs> what? I just realized I'm, I'm on my phone, so I won't be able to tell if we're live. Um, so my <laughs> computer is uh, is oh, just not working out for me today. Mm. So I'm going to wait and see. Okay, we're live. All right, here we go. All right. Um, so usually we wait for just a few moments to make sure people get in the chat. Um, nice to see everybody today. Mm-hmm. And uh, what a discussion we have in store for us. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I feel like we can start and people can catch up. Um, welcome to week nine. Nine. Nine weeks. Nine weeks. Week nine. Um, we are, of course, joined by Dr. Tracy Bearer and Dr. Paul Garrow. And this week we have the great uh, fortune of being joined by Dr. Kim Tallbear. Um, so welcome. Welcome to the discussion. Um, if you'd like to kind of introduce yourself and, and, uh, and let everybody at, know, uh, at home know a little bit about... Um, who you are and why you're here, other than being an incredible speaker and and a knowledgeable person who will help us through this journey today. (laughs) Thank you. So uh, I'm Kim Tallbear. I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta with Paul and Tracy. And I'm also a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples, Techno, Science and Environment. So I research the role of Indigenous peoples in relationship to science and technology from very colonial roles to more decolonial roles more recently. Uh, I also have a blog called The Critical Policy Amorist, which looks at non-monogamy in relationship to settler colonial sexuality, which we're going to be talking about today quite a lot, the settler sexuality topic. So if you want to check out uh, Critical Polyamorist, you can. Um, Let's see. Oh, I'm also developing a course in Indigenous Science and Technology with my colleague, Jessica Kola Penick, which is going to be an online course as well. And I think also not a Coursera course, but accessible to people across Canada and I think lifelong learners. And um, I'm enrolled in the Sistin Wapton Oyate, which is a Dakota people in the northeast corner of what is now South Dakota. And I'm also descended from the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma, which is where the name Tall Bear comes from. So great to be here. Fantastic. And we'll be sure to, um, to link out all of the, uh, all of your information to people so that they can actually get like a direct link uh, to the blog. And, and um, I mean, I, I certainly will. Um, mm-hmm. What a week. What a week. Holy cow. What a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had a lot of questions too, didn't we, this, this week, which is, um, which is great but we always can't get to them. And yesterday we got through three or four, maybe. It was a <laughs> wonderful discussion. And uh, we're really lucky to have uh, Kim here today. She makes a entrance or a splash wherever she goes. She's been uh, a guest in several of my classes. Um, uh, one time I specifically remember, Kim, you were a guest at the Edmonton Institution for Women in our class, uh, Indigenous Women, Life Writing and Autobiography. And you talked about your critical polyamory blog and the poems or um, that you made that were just 100 words. The critical poly 100s, yeah. Oh wow. my gosh, they loved you. They still oh. love you. <sighs> yeah, best guest ever, they say. So sorry oh. to my other guests that were in my class, but yeah. Nice. I thought there were some raised Very. eyebrows from the non-monogamy talk. <laughs> Hard to compare to Dr. Kim Tallbear. So, oh, I rhyme. Sweet. Okay, so now's our time in the show um, that we uh, smudge. So, last week Paul did our smudge, and that was very awesome. Thanks, Paul. Mm-hmm. No problem. I hope they never change the packaging on this. This has been throughout my life, and you always saw it at my grandma's and my mom's, these little red bird matches. Mm-hmm. Okay. And for those of you who don't know just yet, um, I do use sage uh, to smudge. This is sage that we picked in Batosh last summer um, with walking with our sisters. Thank you. 
And for those of you out there, smudge you too. And this smoke is cleansing. It's a spiritual cleansing. And uh, we often do it before ceremonies. Um, I do it every day just to make sure that I walk through the day with um, good heart, good thoughts, that I see the good things in the world, I hear good things, and I speak good things as well. So um, it's always nice to start your day with a spiritual cleansing. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. hi, hi. <clears throat> All right. I could smell that, Tracy, as you lit it. You can. <laughs> I totally could. Yeah, I was like, I should have lit some over here. I feel like it's always in my nose. So uh -huh. any little... Uh sight of it I can reimagine it you know yeah. yeah okay so Dan you said this was a big week for you um tell us what uh what have you been thinking of and what sort of things uh bubbled up in your brain today this well week? I mean I <clears throat> I think as we as we say as we've been starting to say sort of week after week the compounded information um these sort of the way that this course has been laid out allowing people information so that they can better understand the next lesson so that everything we're ingesting has context has been really crucial and i know that there's been a lot of questions um that have been coming in about the role of women um in the communities and throughout history so to finally have gotten to this place where we really kind of have that um the discussions and uh, the the lesson sort of leading up to this so that there is such a context with which we can sort of understand better um, the the role of women and also sort of how colonialism settler colonialism kind of really actively sought to dismantle the power that women held in communities and also I mean I think there are such, um, incredible takeaways for everybody fundamentally in this lesson as well. I mean, I found um, even in terms of the, the talks about gender and sexuality, it was so, the, the, the concept of children being raised in flexible ways, being allowed that kind of space to identify themselves and then build their role in the communities around who they have kind of settled into is such a, I mean, it's, it is such a crucial part of, um, you know, I, I, I sort of speak for myself in this as a, as a gay person, um, even in the eighties being raised in a time when we didn't have that kind of um, understanding available to us as sort of the settler community. It seems to have existed, obviously, in, in indigenous communities long before um, the sort of colonialism came into this. So for me to have read that that was um, really a bedrock uh, sort of concept, and then to have looked at how f far behind sort of the colonial mentality on sexuality and, and gender and how we are kind of predestined into certain roles the, the the concept of binary and anyway i just found that whole conversation to be so necessary and crucial and revelatory for me and it's sad because it's it's been there it is it is a lesson that 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 sort of <laughs> it's also backwards i think because in a way it feels like what was happening before the Europeans came was so universally accommodating to everybody. And then you have the introduction of the settlers who, were, not that things should be sort of moving forward or moving backwards, but it, do, it do, really does feel like they took apart the concept that everyone's life should be celebrated and really prioritized straight, white men and everyone else was kind of pushed down and othered in a way that was perceived to be less powerful, um, weaker than 
um, this kind of ideal concept of of like strength and authority, which is a patriarchal society, a white patriarchal society. So it, there was a lot. I mean, it's a lot to kind of process in terms of being able to <laughs> articulate it clearly, clearly. Um, but it really <laughs> it really opened up a lot of a, a lot of kind of internal conversations with myself about just how how valuable so many of those um, sort of philosophies are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so, you know, week nine is indigenous women, girls and genderful folk. And, you know, oftentimes maybe people wouldn't see themselves in it because it's always nice to read a text and sort of see yourselves in it um, and relate to it. But I think maybe some people more so than uh, maybe the other ones could say, wow, it's not just about women and girls, but it, there's this um, rejection of this binary of male and female and looking at gender on a spectrum. And so perhaps all of us can go, okay, maybe I'm not like strictly female here. Maybe there is something mm -hmm. more about me that I can move on this scale and then be who I am. Um, so, And also just how practical it is to um, capitalize on the skills of the individual instead mm -hmm. of siphoning a person into a, a predetermined or a predestined sort of concept of what you know men and women should be doing. It's just, it mm -hmm. feels like as a community, it's a far more beneficial um, sort of way of really maximizing people's potential. Mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly it. Uh, the maximization for your own community. So it's mm -hmm. not like you are uplifting someone else and somehow you're drowning. It's uplifting and celebrating everyone's skills in mm -hmm. that way. And, uh, mm -hmm. Remember an elder saying very clearly that um, Muniawak or white people were very wasteful of people. Like they mm -hmm. had throwaway people, people that they put marginalized or, or dispossessed. Whereas communities really needed all the people to be working together and to, you know, um, so yeah, very wasteful in, in human resource type of realm. Mm -hmm. Kim, let's ask our guests, what do you think about that? Well, I was just thinking about the wasteful part when you said that. Mm -hmm. I remember a lot of the lessons that I got about what I would now as an academic call non-normative bodies or ways of being, right? But that's not the way you talk about it in your family, right? You talk about people, you might say, well, they're a little different or something. But the lessons I got about that were never a lecture. It was always a, a subtle demonstration of how to treat people. So I had an aunt who settlers might call disabled today. We didn't call her that. It was She was just Betty. And mm -hmm. she had really amazing skills. She had a photographic memory and just could remember everything that had happened throughout the 20th century. And my great grandmother would call on her oh. and say, Betty, who was that that visited us in 1949, mm. you know? <laughs> and, um, and she, you know, she couldn't walk without the aid of a, a, a walker. And I never really quite knew what her quote unquote condition was because she was who she was. And she was very special in the family for all of the reasons that she was special, not simply her disability, but her incredible photographic memory. And the same thing with people who we would call Winkte, right? Like somebody who was uh, born bio biologically or is biologically determined to be male, but who takes up a woman's role. You don't ask questions about how somebody came into being. We would use the word creator, which not everybody might want to use, but the creator makes people how they are. And who are you to question that, mm -hmm. right? And so you just look at them as a unique individual. So that's what I was thinking about when you said that. And um, I think a lot of that comes through in the, um, I hadn't watched the module nine. I hadn't watched the videos until today. Very nice. They're very well done. You communicate really complex ideas in, in accessible language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So oh, thank you. Yeah. Good job, Tracy. <laughs> Me and a whole giant team. I know. I know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah so. Uh, so uh what are you thinking about here, Paul, when we're talking about this sort of wastefulness of people that mm -hmm. I, I immediately jumped to the idea. It's like, boy, patriarchy is so much work. You know, it's so much work to like control people and to like have this like normalcy, you know? And I feel it's, it's really part and parcel of how settler colonialism organizes itself uh, amongst strangers. You know, I've always felt like we're always amongst strangers, 
all the time. So how do strangers deal with each other? It's always by these systems of organizing and, you know, these typologies of gender, sexuality, race, you know? So mm -hmm. I just find that like, why would I want to control anyone in my life, you know? My, and this is a struggle I have too with that, with my children, for example, you know, like how do I control my children in this thing that we're this kind of, we're forced into these settler colonial categories, right? Um, so it, it's constantly, how do I relate to them better and keep their body sovereignty? I don't know if body sovereignty is the right word, but that they are consensually engaging in relations with me as, you know, as a parent, as an uncle and these things. And the same thing with sexuality and, and like, you know, how, if my, if like my sexuality and my children's sexuality, you know, like, or their, their gender fluidity, it's up to them to communicate to me without, you know, that, that authority over things. Right. And I think that's that freedom, that, that freedom to let someone go is the scariest part, mm -hmm. especially when you're among strangers all the time. And I feel like this is uh, something I, I struggle with in terms of like the dispossession of our relations, you know, and I think Kim talks about this really well. And I always talk about, I always refer to Kim in, in the stuff, the work that you do. I listen to uh, Media Indigenous, like I binged it all summer walking around my neighborhood, <laughs> which is really fun. And you've come up with some amazing, challenging things for me as a heterosexual, you know, white coated man, you know, living in a long term monogamous relationship. How do I constantly uh, give the freedom to my to my wife, my spouse, my partner, my friend, and my children, you know, mm -hmm. and my sisters and my brothers, my mother, you know, like, as well as my, the other non the more than human people around me, you know, so how do I live in good relations? And I'm constantly struggling through that um, as I work through this world, right? Mm. How do you not oh, impinge well, on their freedom? <laughs> yeah, how do we, yeah, impinge on their freedom, but but not become ambivalent to their yeah. ways, right? Because yeah, that's the yeah. thing. It's like, I could be easily ambivalent about your gender, your sexuality, your, your you know, your your experience as a, as a uh, mm -hmm. racialized person, you know, all these things, right? And yet at the same time, what a gift you're giving just in your curiosity and your ability to ask those questions and be aware of that. I think so many yeah. people don't even have that kind of introspection. And that's where I think a lot of um, non-straight people um, end up being, you know, it, the concept of wasting humans, I think is a, a huge um it is the that, that is so perfectly articulated because it is such a it is choosing to turn a blind eye to the yeah. strengths and the expressions of so many people who just don't happen to fit a certain code so mm -hmm. i mean for me you know as as a gay person the fact that a parent and a spouse is having that kind of conversation is huge considering so many people so many children parents don't have those conversations so many children's parents are are bound by a set of you know uh regulations or or self-imposed kind of laws or religious based concepts that um inform them or speak for them without cha challenging them in any way um and I guess that kind of leads me to a, a question that I had had, which is the concept of um, sort of patriarchy. Um, how did that start in the sense that it was clearly like, that's a, I mean, that's a very broad like question. That. So let me refine, refine it slightly. <laughs> but you have, you have this patriarchy that came over and has infiltrated the land. And I guess my question is, was it tied to faith or was it something broader than that? And if it was faith, is that what sort of led to this? Is, is, is it sort of a male fragility? Is it a fear-based thing? And, and how did that affect the indigenous communities beyond just the concept of, of patriarchy? Was there anything else attached to where that patriarchy came from that also was kind of, um, I guess in a way like, like helping to drive that um, or, or spread it throughout the communities. Does that my question make any sense? Yep. Ish. 
this to you that yeah, history. We want you to answer it. Well, but I think I um I mean I think a lot about the transfer of ideas from the church to science and the state, but ultimately is the church the source of it? I'm sure there's some historian who knows this. Mm. <laughs> um I right mean, in. I do think I do think a lot of people go back to religion, right? And I see this in the non-monogamy community as well. People are always pinning it all on religion. Oh, it's religion and faith that have made yeah. people uh, hold up monogamy as the, and virginity and all these kind of modes of being pure and good, right? But I actually see science and the state reinforcing those things as well. But it is possible that because all, scientists were creationists largely before Darwin. So they were mm -hmm. doing both, right? They weren't always as separate as they like to pretend that they are. And of course, the church is the Chris, Christianity has been heavily influential in the state in the US and Canada, right? But I don't know, Tracy, Paul? You bet. I, it, it's, <laughs> we are so dedicated, we're so attached that we will, you know, we will turn to forms of violence to keep these restrictive gender binaries to keep heterosexuality, to keep monogamy. You know, you can see instances, and yes, I say violence. I mean, there has been murder on behalf of, you know, keeping these restrictions. Why mm. are we so attached to these? What, what does society gain from keeping attached to a male, female gender um, and heterosexuality and monogamy? Mm. That's right. The way that I teach, um the way I've been teaching and reading history in terms of like settler colonial history is that with what Kim is saying, it's like there's this circle of like missionaries and merchants and the crown that are civilizing and uncivilized people, right? Mm -hmm. And that uncivilized means that the, the people who are not civilized are not upholding and uplifting the institutions of the crown of capitalism or merchant, you know, uh, empire building and uh, mm -hmm. church church engagement, right? Doctrine of discovery and all these things. So it's like we are part of this long discourse of um, of this heteropatriarchy. It just gets more sophisticated as the 19th century and 20th century start to like, like uh, maybe Kim talking talking about, about this more, but about the technology of it, right? Like we talked mm -hmm. about the Holocaust a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. That is a very modern piece of, of refined racism, right? So, and that also involved uh, sexuality, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and ability. So, so incredible to think of it. And then what lessons can we learn by focusing or centering indigenous ways of thinking and being, right? And indigenous ontologies and epistemologies. Um, you know, there's just so much to learn, even in a way of just like flipping it around and just saying, well, let's focus on this and see how this undermines a lot of this uplifting of these institutions, right? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, as you say that, I mean, settlers and racists are really actually quite clever and sophisticated in the way that yes. they <laughs> construct these elaborate kind of systems, right? I was thinking when you were talking about the, I think ultimate, I think the ultimate binary is savage civilized and who gets, as you were saying with civilized and people might want to debate that, but who gets classed as civilized versus who gets classed as savage, less evolved, denigrated, you know, and you can yeah. think about all the categories that fall onto the denigrated and savage side. It's not only indigenous people, right? It's black people, it's queer folks, it's the disabled, it's women, you know, below yeah. men. Um, mm -hmm. And so the church has done that, the state has done that, and science has done that. Who's a rational thinker? You know, yeah. who's capable of making decisions on behalf of the collective versus who's irrational, yeah. who's, who's hysterical, right? <laughs> so, and they've saturated every, every sector of society with this binary. That's right. There has been this, you know, pervasive <laughs> history of the dispossession of our bodies. You know, we have the legislative dominance of the Indian Act. And yes. you know, if if you want to look at the colonial agenda, um, just look at some of the pictures of residential school uh, students, kids. Really, um, yeah. you know, the the females are have the short cut bob. Mm. They have the gender clothing, the little dress, a little apron sometimes, and then the boys shaved heads, and then you know, the little suits or or whatever they could afford. So you know. Paul talks, we all talk a lot about the kinship relationship and, and how if we think about um, the colonial project, it's also to split up that kinship. And so yeah. that starts, starts with that gender dispossession or um, separation. So families, brothers and sisters were together 
they didn't have their mom or dad or aunts or uncles or any of their extended family. They had each other, but then the mm. boys were sent one way and the girls were sent the other to separate and, you know, isolate them in a way. So we see the gendered project happening even then. Yeah. It's like, it's a dispossession. So the, all this the conversation about sexuality too and gender is about our dispossession in our bodies about making our own choices, right? Mm -hmm. It's about being told who you are and what fits as normative, right? And that's, I guess that's scary for a white guy mowing his lawn or something, right? Jim? Yeah, I, mean, I can I can imagine that that this particular conversation is going to be a hard one for people who are quite religious, um, yeah. because it really does challenge the concept. I think a lot of um, certain religious elements really um, are rooted in protecting only one kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, I think that's hard for people who have kind of grown up with that, with that, you know, uh, concept of right and wrong, hell and heaven and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I mean, you know, obviously as someone who uh, apparently is going to hell, um, nah. kind of like, you know, the, the concept of really fostering people's strengths and supporting people and celebrating the spirit of, of kind of being human is in, you know, w is the most religious thing that I can think of. Mm -hmm. It is the most kind of deeply human and supportive and loving and spirited act of kindness and empathy you can provide someone. Yeah. As opposed to yeah. kind of turning a blind eye and saying, well, you're going to hell. Um, which, again, is a very kind of easy way for people to rid themselves of any kind of responsibility or, you know, or, mm -hmm. or self-reflection on, like, empathy. What, you know, what it, you know, who is this person as it pertains to me? It's very easy to be guided by someone you don't know than to actually have that kind of agency over your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. What's well, interesting, because Paul said that, what did you say, Paul, that the maintaining the patriarchy is actually quite a lot of work? Yeah. But it also sounds like Dan is saying that in a way it lets you out of individual responsibility, right? So there's both mm -hmm. things going on. It's a tremendous amount of societal work to maintain that oppressive system. Yeah. On the other hand, what is what are certain individuals getting out of that? How can they be lazy? How can they be controlling, right? How can they not be self-reflective about their own individual role in their families and communities and oppressing people? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe the thing is that what makes it easy is that we re-internalize and reify those, those like values in our in ourselves, in our bodies, in our relationships. You know, like when, when you hear about Republican women, for example, and being, you know, voting for Trump, for example, you know, you're like, why would you do that? He's like oppressing women, uh, like at every step, right? But there's this internalization that goes to making these structures easy to maintain and easy to uphold, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought we were gonna get through one show without mentioning that guy's name. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Trump, I mean, sorry, that's his real name, no, his Christian name. I see your larger point, though. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. I came across this amazing uh, saying, and it talks about it was, um, a woman named Elsie Redbird, I think. And she says something like the erosion of sovereignty comes from disempowering women, and I would say girls and genderful folk, mm -hmm. and it's renewed strength. So the renewal of sovereignty will come from re-empowering them. And so mm. I you know part of our work is to re-empower and that is knowledge and, and making knowledge accessible through this. Making space, making space, yeah. right? Making that space. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, okay, our first question. What? <laughs> 40 minutes in. <laughs> uh, this is from uh, Muriel. Um, very much looking forward to the discussion with Dr. Tallbear this Sunday. She would like to hear your thoughts on how to decolonize and feminize academia, science, and knowledge uh, dissemination in general. And I'm mm. like, whoa, I'm going to pass the buck on that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's and a I big question. So, you know, um, take what you want from that, Kim, but uh, I think she's pointing at you. Well, remember, I was going to go make some notes on that, and I didn't. 
I'm actually, I'm actually going to bring up um, an article that I want to quote and tell people about, which um, will help me answer that question. And it's by um, Adam Godry, and mm -hmm. who's in our faculty, also a Métis scholar, and Danielle Lorenz, who I think was a grad student in ed at U of A when this was published. And it was in the journal Alternative, uh, like spelled like alternative, but in two parts, alternative. And it's called Indigenization as Inclusion, Reconciliation, and Decolonization, Navigating Different Visions for Indigenizing the Canadian Academy. And so that's kind of what I think about. Um, I think about those three modes of uh, what we want to do in the academy. And I think I said yesterday when we were prepping for this that I'm not so sure I would talk about feminizing the academy, although... I think you can make an argument for that, but I think I'm coming from this place of decolonizing uh, and indigenizing, but in a way that, I don't wanna use the backwards forwards language, right? I, I'm really working to avoid that kind of, cause I wanna disrupt this notion of progress, right? Yes. And I wanna think more about being in relation and a lot of my work lately and the people I'm in conversation with is about thinking about being in relations, about a, about a web, you know, not to be cliche, but about a web of, of existence <laughs> um, and that we're not moving forwards and backwards like settlers and Christianity and science wants to tell us, but that we're always in relation. And that means something that happens here on the web has reverberations across the web for somebody else. So we always have to think about who are we maybe affecting and what we're doing without even necessarily knowing them. So we always have to think, I think going back to what you said, Tracy, too, about starting the day in a good way, what I say might affect somebody over there that I'm not even thinking about, right? And so mm -hmm. that's what that web thing does versus the linear thing, which is wait till heaven, wait till the afterlife, she you'll froze. get your reward then. And then you don't have to think necessarily about what you're doing here. Anyway, I kind of got off track <laughs> to go back no. to that question. Not at all. Uh, there is <laughs> an interconnectedness. And I, I think the web is a really, you know, our elders and our knowledge keepers constantly go back to referencing and, and metaphors that we find just outside our own door. Mm -hmm. So even though some people might think the spider web is overused, like the dream catchers, but, um, <laughs> but you know, they're, they're really, there's some intelligence that we can gain from just looking outside and spending time yeah. looking. So I don't mm -hmm. think it's overused at all. Well, if you look at the web as a theory, right? Think about the web. That's your theory. You know, how does it move? How does it work? You know, um, anyway, so that's what I think about when I'm thinking about how, how we decolonize the academy, science, knowledge dissemination. Um, I, I think a lot about what's the difference between simply including Indigenous people and other um, marginalized people into the project, right? You can do that. You can rainbow up your laboratory. You can mm -hmm. say, I'm going to provide scholarships for black students and indigenous students and queer students, etc. cetera. Um, but you get to the second step, which is how are the step of reconciliation, which is actually about how does the rest of Canada need to change? What does it need to learn? Because the project of re reconciliation is not chiefly on the backs of indigenous people who are the colonized. It's everybody else who needs to figure out how to act better, learn more about us, which they're doing if they're taking this course. And then the third level is actual uh, decolonization, which did we read? Uh, I don't know if you cited Tuck and Yang's article uh, in this series mm -hmm. yet. Uh, decolonization yep. is not a metaphor. They speak specifically about decolonization being about land back, the repatriation of indigenous land and life. Uh, and we can take life to mean something really broadly. So I think about it in terms of science. What are we repatriating? What mm -hmm. kind of uh, resources are going back to indigenous communities to do a science that serves them rather than a science where they're just the object of the scientist gaze, right? Where they're the mm -hmm. specimen under the microscope, mm -hmm. which is usually how we've been. What's wrong with indigenous people? What's wrong with their bodies? What's wrong with them? Why are they so traumatized? It must be in their genetics. Uh, hmm, maybe it's colonization. <laughs> <laughs> and, right. Maybe we can ask better questions, right? So that's kind of what I think yes. about in terms of that question. Mm. Um, she, oh, has, she has a couple things here. She said, um, how did you decide to become a scientist and what women inspired you and or helped you pursue your dream? Well, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> so this, yeah, people often think that my, <laughs> my scientist, indigenous scientist friends will be like, 
you're not a scientist. Why does everybody <laughs> say that? But just because I'm always promoting their cause so much, right? And I work yeah. with, I'm one of the founding faculty of the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics, or SING. Uh, we were founded in the U.S. in 2011, and every year we have about 20 young aspiring Indigenous scientists and community members, not always young, sometimes young, who come in and do a week worth of lab science and uh, like computer stuff around the science, um, all genomics related. But we also sometimes get community leaders who want to come in and sort Sort of figure out what's the culture of the lab, what's the culture of genomics, how can I broker better research arrangements at home. Our ultimate goal is to train more Indigenous scientists to do science again that serves us and to become science policy advisors, bioethicists. Um, and I just got so involved with uh, promoting their work after having first studied them because I'm, I'm an anthropologist of science as well. So my, my first book was on uh, Native American DNA, was on the kind of history of race politics and genome science on Indigenous people. And then through that, I met a lot of critical scientists who were not like the ones I was critiquing in my book, but who were trying to do things differently. And I guess I hang out with them so much now and talk about their work so much that people think I'm one of them. They made relations with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they don't like when I get called a scientist, which is right, because I haven't done a PhD in pharmacogenomics, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I don't want to impinge on their turf. And then who inspired me? That was the other one. Yeah who, mm -hmm. yeah, who inspired me? Well, I, I talk about this a lot of times. I've got two formative theorists, uh, and this is before I was five years old. So I tell this story a lot. The Vine Deloria Jr.'s book, Custer Died for Your Sins, was published, I think, in 1969. I'm born in 68. My mm -hmm. mom's an undergraduate at a college in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and the American Indian movement activism is all around when I'm a kid. And I remember knowing who George Armstrong Custer was. But I never understood the Jesus died for your sins phrase. I did that didn't make sense at four. And then the book came out, Custer died for your sins. I'm like, uh, what? So I asked my mom what that meant. And so mm. I grew up with Vine Deloria's thinking. And so he was a formative theorist for me before I could read. So was my mom, who Leanne Talbear, who brought all, you know, told us Dakota oral history, but also had books like by Vine Deloria in the house. And when I'd come home from school with some BS whitewashed interpretation of native people, she would <laughs> set the record straight. So I was really nice. lucky. Nice. That, yeah. Nice. Yeah. And then many other people in the academy, but those are the first two. Mm -hmm. so. um, besides Singh, which is Summer Internship of Indigenous People and Genomics, is there any other organization that supports Indigenous girls interested in pursuing a career in STEM? the last part of her question. Yeah, and there are quite a lot of uh, STEM, especially summer programs for Indigenous youth. Um, in terms of uh, uh, girls and women, um, there is one I've been involved in here in Edmonton called Sistering Indigenous and Western Science. I think the acronym is SINU, it's like a SINU. And it was spearheaded by women working for Natural Resources Canada. And they give a $12,000 bursary to young women, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. They pair them up to do a research project together. Um, and they so they also get professional mentoring. So somebody like me could be a mentor as well, uh, as I also have given talks at some of their launch programs. So I thought that was a really, really, I don't know if Natural Resources Canada is extending the funding, they might want to because it's a great project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, sinews, you can look them up at uh, sinewsproject.com. Very cool. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Every time I, I talk with you, Kim, it's like you're involved in so many different layers and so many different pots of moving. I think it's a testament to your active brain that you just never rest, it seems. You're like always mm -hmm. going. Well, you know, I need a personal assistant, though, because I don't often get uh -huh. places on time. <laughs> <laughs> Any volunteers? I need to win the lottery. And that's the first thing I'm going to do is pay a personal assistant. That is so prairie to say. <laughs> to win the what? lottery. <laughs> I don't to win even, the lottery. Well, you got to buy a lottery ticket to win it, right? Yes. So that's the first <laughs> step. So they said. <laughs> okay, this is uh, Nathaniel. She's English, gay, trans, he, English, he. gay, transgender, trans, transgender man. So he said, this week was a particular interest uh, to me. Not that the rest of them haven't been, but this resounded the most. I'm interested to, um, to learn how Indigenous communities allow children to grow up and form their own ideas of self and in particular gender. And I think, Dan, you addressed that. That was um, mm -hmm. something that you noticed in, in this particular module, uh, allowing children uh, 
that growth benefits community better using their talents and gifts rather than being forced into stereotypical gendered roles. I wish I had been allowed as a youth. His mm. question, pre-contact were there roles that were usually filled by those from the two-spirit or non-conforming community within ceremony and such. When colonization happened and continues to happen, Mm -hmm. And the Indian Act forced communities to break up by a disenfranchisement in residential schools. What happened to those roles? Were they taken over by the newly created patriarchy? Or did they just disappear as a system didn't allow for anything other than the binary, specifically men, to hold positions of importance? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so... Uh, we have been stating um, that any actions or behaviors um, that didn't conform to sort of a heteropatriarchal normative and specific gender roles were shamed. They were seen as barbaric and uncivilized. Um, we see this from the archives and missionaries archives, explorers um, writing back to their countries, the, the shock that they felt, not only when they saw women in leadership positions, but when they saw genders stepping outside their restrictive lens of what they're supposed to be doing. And so we see this shame um, being pushed upon uh, and uh, the Indigenous peoples back then. But I think, you know, as Kim pointed out, um, there in her culture, there's the wink take, right? And we see, and we use the word um, uh, uh, genderful or two-spirit somehow to describe this but every language has every indigenous language has their own term for describing these really specially important people and yes they did have ceremony and i think maybe some tribes they 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 shamed it out of them um, but i think that knowledge has stayed really strong in many cultures and so we still are looking at those words we're we're turning back to our languages and going wow, we have these words that are embedded right inside that. And that means that they were important to us. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, Kim, what do you think about that? I have so much mm. to say, I don't know where to start. Um, mm. I, I do think, and I was thinking about the the film clip that Billy Ray Belcourt had as well in this, uh, in this week, in this module, right? And I, I just watched that this morning for the first time and that it was also making me think a lot about the tension between what our ancestors knew mm -hmm. and what was disrupted by settlers uh, um, and shamed and oppressed viciously and what it is possible to quote unquote recover. And I think a lot about this because I do think we have both a lot of um, knowledge and ethical ways of being still embedded in the way that we relate with one another, maybe as extended families or, you know, that story I told about not shaming somebody for being quote unquote disabled, but mm -hmm. finding what's special about them and the same thing for gender non-conforming people. Yeah. So I do still think we have these baseline ethical ways of being if we don't necessarily have all the words, if we don't necessarily have all the knowledge, right? Because those things were so viciously suppressed by residential schools, uh, by many of the institutions we have to engage with. So um, I think there's a role for language learning in this, although I've talked to young Dakota um, women and two-spirit people uh, who are doing a language learning group who said, you know, we need to have language learning groups about sexuality and sexual practices because some of our elders who know the languages best are also products of residential schools, right? Or, or yeah. are nece aren't necessarily comfortable talking about sexuality openly. So this is a real predicament for us. Um, and it may be where we have to do what Billy Ray says. If, you, if we've lost some of that language because of the shame, we may need to go back to those baseline ethical ways of being and we need to invent new language. We may need to do that, mm -hmm. right? We may need to come out of those core values and say, what are the ways in which we inhabit gender today? Um, because we don't live in 1850, right? We don't live in 1740. We live now with all of these institutions and we are gonna have to figure out how to manifest these core values of people in this world, right? Um, and we can't simply return. Right, no, so, that's super important. Yeah. And a really good example of that is a, a group I was invited to be with, um, Lana Whiskey Jack. Uh, it's called the Laughing Beavers, uh, a Miskwak uh, Kepapit. 
And we call laughing beavers because uh, she brings her Auntie Athena and some old, uh, they're not, they're Cree speakers, uh, older women, older aunties, and they talk dirty to us. And we mm -hmm. learn Cree through talking dirty. Um, we each get our own <laughs> names. And it makes it really fun, you know, we talk about sexuality and we talk it in a really comfortable sort of way. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's a beautiful revitalization. And I actually, until you said that, Kim, I thought yeah. um, I hadn't thought of that as being this new way of re-empowering um, just our little group through mm -hmm. language and, and learning. Yeah. And talking about scandalous things I hear from language learning experts is the best way to learn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. It imprints in our brains, right? It like, does, yes. Yeah. But hopefully one day talking about sex and all those things won't be scandalous. So my great grandmother was Métis. Mm. She was from Saskatchewan, but she got exiled <laughs> to South Dakota with all the Dakotas, right? Yeah. But I remember her whispering, and I still can't say it, when she wanted to talk about your vagina, she would whisper a word. <laughs> and, and so that was, and I was like thinking that must be a Métis or a Cree word for vagina mm. anyway, but she they would whisper, like they would go into the language and whisper stuff when they wanted to talk mm. about sex. So they did know some stuff. <laughs> uh, there's it's just so much potential of like in indigenous ways to like to push against, like to resist this patriarch the center of patriarchy and uh -huh. sexism, right? I yeah. love that story so much. I love the fact that uh, in Amiskwichi, Wisconsin, you know, like Beaver Hills, there's this beaver, this beaver <laughs> enclave of like erotic, sexy, happy uh, women, Cree women. It's really fun. Well, we, we have the Beaver Hills Burlesque <laughs> Collective too now, right? That's yes. our grad student, Kristen Linquist, founded. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Kristen yeah. Linquist. Awesome. Yeah. Beaver Hills Burlesque. Yeah. And you know, her it, name, her dance name is Pemmican Milkshake, right? Pemmican Milkshake, which sounds gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Can I just say to you, like, I find that um, I've always been sort of like caught up on this idea of pre-contact and post-contact. And I'm really happy what you're saying, Kim, because I think we often always look at that, that as being the big poison that, you know, that poisoned all of this land and these relations and stuff. But there's resiliency all the way through, you know, and um <laughs> I love it. I love listening to these stories because it reminds me a lot of like the things that happen underneath the the, the sort of repression of mm -hmm. white settler society that happens amongst, you know, the ones that I grew up in French Canadian society and, and the repression that comes with that, right? Where you don't talk about your body, you don't talk about gender, um, you don't talk about gender mixing or, you know, all these things come in and I have another quick yeah. funny story about my great grandmother. So the day I went off to university and my mom was driving me down to Texas, my grandma brought me into her bedroom and sat me on the bed and she gave me some money. And she said, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. And then she said, my mom was out in the living room and my grandma said, just keep your legs closed. <laughs> and I busted out crying. I was like sobbing because I was so sex repressed too. I'm like, what do you think oh of me, God. grandma? And my mom came running in, grandma, what did you say to her? <laughs> so anyway, because you know, she was she was forced into Catholic school, right? As a yeah, as a right. and, and so she was, yeah, very, very frank about sex, but also very it's dirty. <laughs> It's so it's so funny how many times Métis, uh, Métis political conferences end with a really good dirty joke, which what? are really? always amazing. <laughs> yeah. Really? Huh. Yeah. It's great. That's oh, awesome. <laughs> Maybe if we have time, Paul, you can think of one to tell us. I, I will. Know. I was just I about will to tell say. You what? <laughs> You're putting that teaser out for people. Now you have to deliver, yeah, we have man. To, we have to wait to the end for the banana split. <laughs> This whole idea of uh, body sovereignty is like, um, I've read something about cultural sovereignty too. And what they say is that it, what it, that is as an effort for indigenous nations and indigenous peoples to exercise their own values and their own norms in restructuring their collective futures. Yeah. You know, and, and what do we wanna see in the future? What does that look like for us? And you know, a lot of that happens, what I think is recreating this world, you know, that validates and recognizes all forms of life, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think we recognize and validate all forms of life just yet. No, we objectify everything, right? They're all in the pocket, right? Mm. For sure. And I think that I also was, just, yeah, sorry. No, go, Paul. 
I was going to say too, I wanted to challenge our idea of the spectrum too. We always see spectrum like the way, what Kim was saying is really important that like we see, we see these things like a web is a little bit, is a better metaphor to understand relations and how things are situated and how we affect people. But one, I always think about the color wheel spectrum that we see when we, whenever we choose a color on like word documents or something like that, like oh that, God. that is a spectrum that is very circular in that is effective but still presents all of these different shades that are mm -hmm. super important to all of us. Like gender is so important to me. I studied it throughout university, trying to figure things out for as a straight cisgendered, you know, white adjacent Métis man, you know? So mm -hmm. it's just, I love that idea so much, you know, like I could see all the colors and they're all related to each other in a, in a, in a good way, you know? Aw, now when I see that, I'm gonna always think of that story, Paul. That's beautiful. I really yeah, I'll love tell that. you. I'll tell you a dirty joke at the end too, to, to help. <laughs> <laughs> and that You're goes good, back to what Kim said, and I don't know if you quoted this first, but you said "rainbow up." Rainbow, oh, yeah, up rainbow up. Yeah. Rainbow up. Mm. yeah. People are looking for things to do. Rainbow up, man. I think it also like the concept that everything is on a spectrum and that nothing is clearly defined is just also like such a clear path to empathy. Because mm -hmm. I think anytime, even if you're in a disagreement with someone, it's generally based on the fact that the person you're in a disagreement is doing something that you wouldn't do. And the concept yeah. of putting something on a spectrum I mean, that's, I'm, I'm sort of, making a point? I'm a very compartmentalized person. So it's like, yeah. I like things to live in my kind of world. And if it doesn't, I've had to really train myself to realize that everybody's brain works in a different way. Everybody's mm -hmm. priorities are different. Everybody is on a spectrum of thought, of gender, of sexuality. And that allows for the kind of space for you to say, it might not be how I've done it, but I can understand and respect the fact that this is how you are doing it, that this is where you have been led, as opposed to shutting a door on a person's conversation because they don't share my belief in something. Um, so the concept that, you know, my, my friend and I have this sort of um, running philosophy that anytime we kind of are having a conversation and we don't understand it, it just ends with, well, it's their journey. Mm. you know it's like they might be making decisions or that I don't agree with but at the end of the day it is their journey and if it takes them to a good place or if they think they're doing something right and you know all you can really do is either stand back or support whatever's happening yeah. understanding mm -hmm. that everyone has a different path and it might not always align with you know your own kind of concept of 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 right and wrong mm -hmm. i mean obviously if someone's a criminal like you don't you know there's <laughs> limitations oh, to what that dirty. concept <laughs> is it's like you yeah. know it's yeah. it, whatever but um this the concept of spectrum i think is such a crucial um gateway to just understanding each other better mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um I, we had lots more to say on this, but there's a couple more I think we should get mm. to. Mm -hmm. And this yeah, is- read the transcript. <laughs> <laughs> this is Joanne. Mm -hmm. um, she says she has two questions. Uh, she loved listening to Billy Ray Belcourt talk about reconciling mm -hmm. the language and mm -hmm. identities of the past with new kinds of identities, <clears throat> subjectivities and ways of knowing that are being brought to the community by queer people. Could you speak to this idea more broadly? And does this idea speak to other aspects of indigenous cultures? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I guess I could add this. Um, uh, also module nine, the word hermaphrodite is used several times. I think there's some stigma associated with this word. And I'm wondering if it could be replaced with intersex in the reading at least. And I said, thank you so much, Joanne. Um, I love it when people point out those types of things and we definitely need to address that word. And I think although some intersex people um, are reclaiming this word hermaphrodite, it's probably not useful in our indigenous Canada uh, anymore. So Paul is making edits. And so we will be changing. I have a pen. Yeah, so, <laughs> so thank you, Joanne, for pointing that out to us. It's important mm -hmm. for us to 
uh, evolve and, and, and move um, in respectful ways in this realm. Mm -hmm. So Dan, did you have something to say about uh, to this question? You know, I think it just be, listen, I, 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 I can only kind of speak to a very small part of that. Um, but I think it, it, it's, it's sort of contributing to the larger conversation that we were having earlier. And I think what, what, um, what Kim was saying too, just the concept of being aware, like you can't just, it's hard to just sort of hire someone peripherally or to, you know, the concept of giving scholarships to people. It almost requires, it requires a deeper understanding other than a more peripheral approach to surrounding yourself with different voices and different experiences. Um, I'm trying to find a sort of a way to articulate this clearly, but I think it's like, you know, this is sort of the only example I can use because it's in my it's it's in my everyday. But it's like if you know when you're when you're writing about something, um, for example, it's always crucial to consult with to have people around you that are that are living the experiences of the people you are writing, so that you're not writing an experience that is not true to somebody. And I think in my experience, you know. I tried to make sure when I was writing about, you know, a, a queer and gay relationship on my show, it was so crucial to me that that be as authentic as it possibly can because I have been raised on seeing my experience misrepresented time and time and time again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in this conversation, I can only sort of bring from my own experience, but I just think there is such value and necessity in making sure that there are a variety of voices and perspectives in every room so that the decision-making, the language, the care that's being put into whatever is being done is respecting everybody's experience. Because I think that's where we're, we're sort of getting to this point where I think it's, it's, it's in certain areas, it's, it's really improving, but I think for a very long time, it had been white, patriarchal, straight, people making a lot of decisions creatively, professionally, economically, you know, uh, politically. And there are not enough people, there weren't enough voices in the room saying, hey, that doesn't service everybody. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not inclusive. That is only benefiting a certain type of person. But when you shut all those different people out, again, it just allows for kind of a safe path for one type of person. So, yeah, it, you know. Ah. I like that, a safe path for one type of person and that everyone falls to the wayside. Yeah, yeah. Mm -mm. Mm. And Kim, um, is there something you'd like to say about this idea of Billy Ray Belcourt's, so, you know, mm -hmm. what are these new kinds of identities and subjectivities and ways of knowing that he might be talking about? Yeah, I often wonder, um... Uh, only because I, as I think I said in the video for this week that I came to feminist feminism and queer theory a bit later through science, right? And that, that was my road into thinking about those critiques of science. And then I came to their critiques of the state and other things. Um, I do think a lot about what queer as a term and concept does for us as indigenous people and what it doesn't do for us. And mm. so I think that isn't, I was really thinking about what Billy Ray Belcourt was saying in that video clip. I think we always have to ask ourselves queer in relationship to what norm. Mm. And so these indigenous ways of inhabiting gender fluidity and the different kinds of roles that we have might be queer according to a settler norm. And they have certainly probably come to be queer in these kinds of the way that gender binarism and heteronormativity has been imposed upon indigenous communities again very viciously by the by the state and the church. But our ancestors' ways of being would have seemed queer to settlers now. We should not think of them as queer. That is our that I think that can be an aspirational norm. But again, not that we go back, which, which Billy Ray was was cautioning against, because we can't simply go back, you know, we can't operate outside of a colonial system, although we can take swings at it with a hammer and try to make cracks in it, right? 
Um, so that's what I think about. I think, and so I know a lot of indigenous people who will say, yes, I'm queer, but they might also say I'm two spirit. And some of them might identify as Winkte or some of the other, the, the term in Navajo uh, that, that you talked about in the video. So we do have peoples in our communities reclaiming or who never lost those traditional ways of, of doing gender and sexuality in, in different ways. But I just would ask us to be mindful about the fact that, that to be, to, to be Winkte, I don't think is to be queer necessarily. It might be looked upon that way by the dominant society. That was a normative role. It might not have been the most common role, but mm -hmm. it was normal. It was usual. Um, it might, mm -hmm. and each different people have their own form of special, specialness. It's not to say that they didn't have special aspects to them, but we all have special aspects to us. So that's kind of, that's what I think about as I grapple with uh, indigenous queer theory. Um, mm -hmm. And I used to teach a class at Texas called it indigenizing queer theory. I no longer teach that class because I don't think that's the project. I, I now call that class disrupting sex, disrupting nature. And I'm mm -hmm. trying to disrupt the whole idea that sexuality and nature are coherent categories that we should be managed through. Again, I want to go back to relational frameworks. Yep. I want us to think about being in relation. That's a much deeper worldview changing project than is the project of indigenizing queer theory. I've always been struck by a, a sticker that was on your computer a long time ago that said, make kin, not babies. Oh, I got it. We got in trouble for that. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> that, was, that was my PhD advisor, Donna Haraway's so, um, phrase, make kin, not babies. And we ended up doing a book uh, a couple years ago with some other authors that we changed the name to make kin, not population, because mm. people didn't want, they were afraid of, you know, the racist white guys who, who think population's the biggest problem and not the distribution of resources and wealth around the world. Yep. And so as not to get aligned with that. But yeah, we were, for me, being a kind of antinatalist indigenous women woman like i i'm i really think we you know as an individual choice right i am not about the collective obviously we've been genocided right you know we we need indigenous people and we need more of them but as an individual i i want us to think carefully about the role that we we shouldn't feel compelled to 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 birth children right we mm -hmm. should not feel compelled as women to do that uh it and and uh people have different hungers to produce babies depending on their gender, right? And it, that's not just to uh, force women into that category. But yeah, I'm really into making kin. And this is one of the resonances I found with queer people. It's why I think queer people are such, could be such amazing allies in indigenous yeah. liberation and us and theirs, because, mm -hmm. because they also have had to have this value of making kin because their sexualities and their relationships have been made deviant. They've been suppressed. You know, how many queer and trans youth have been thrown out of their homes by their families of origin? Like what? Mm -hmm. I can't imagine committing that kind of violence against my child. But so many of them have faced that, right? And so I do think there's a lot for us to talk about in terms of making kin and making family. And that's why I, I love I love so much queer theory too. So beautiful. Yeah. Jeez, Dan. <laughs> it's like, <boo. laughs> like you this is a chat. Something. This is a this is a chat. Awesome. This is a discussion that is really um I think gonna there's a lot of I think uh, orbital conversations that are going to really stem from this. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think um, I, I absolutely love the way you made that connection. And, you know, I always say Paul keeps talking about kinship, but really all of our conversations have gone into what is that interconnectedness? What is that relationship? Because when you talk about relationship, then you also have the addition of accountability and reciprocity and love and, and right. community. And so we can see that happening. Why, why is it, and you explained this already, that I guess I wanted to ask people, why is it that all of these marginalized people, oftentimes queer people, indigenous people, um, people of color. Black people of color, yep. Yeah. They're, they're on the margins. So what we're getting is all these, this incredible knowledge and this incredible power from the margins. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Constantly. Yes. And I think that's so inspiring. That is so inspiring that like, it's about decentering whiteness, right? That like, we don't have to perform whiteness as an ideology. 
because the power is already there. That's remember last week we talked about like why don't we have an Indian indigenous person in charge of INAC? And it's just like, well, because mm. it's not about it's about managing indigenous bodies yeah. and not about about uh, you know the governance of indigenous you know engagement, right? Mm -hmm. So I find these conversations so helpful and so fruitful on terms of not performing that whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. In my everyday life, right into my body. So, and that is the big challenge because that's all we see. That's like the way you're saying, Dan, it's like all we see is this hetero, uh, like a heteronormative interpretation of, of like gay culture or gay like experience, mm -hmm. right? And it's just like over and over and over again. Oh, man, so I think this is so much fun to engage in. Hey, Kim, I know you're the you're the best. I love hearing you talk at all these little. Oh. All these Can I give a plug for a so new strong. book that people yeah. might want to read? Yes, this, new, uh, this new book is out by Jane Ward, mm. "The Tragedy of Heterosexuality." And it's on New York University Press. So I'm just going to read the little sum up in it. In the tragedy of heterosexuality, Jane Ward challenges and entertains readers with a serious joke. She reverses the usual story of queer suffering to elaborate instead the miseries of heterosexual life, especially for women and the ecstatic joys of queer alternatives. She provides us with a sharply hilarious account of the heterosexual repair industry, like how much work it is to keep everybody straight, right? Mm. <laughs> including exactly. including Abbott and ethnography of commercial seduction coaching and follows up with the pointed queer observations of straight life, offering herself as an ally and calling for a transformation of deep heterosexuality. Anyway, it looks great. I haven't read it yet, but wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I, I really like this form of, I heckle settlers all the time. I try to provincialize <laughs> them. Right. So I want to make white people realize how curious and fascinating they are and they really should be studied like indi in indigenous people yeah. we're just normal like we're normal you're weird why don't we study white people and she's kind of doing the same thing with straights right i love yeah. it <laughs> well and i think it's and, and you realize i'm sure there's a lot of i'm sure there's a lot of heterosexual people out there who are going to be slightly on the defense when it comes to a book like that mm -hmm. and i think yeah. what we've been doing through these discussions what they, people have been learning through this course is that the fragility of our own experience should should be an excitement about understanding other people's perspectives mm. and i i would be very curious i'm sure there's a lot of people when you've lifted up that book and showed that title to people out there i'm sure there were a group of people um who are really questioning well uh, I, that's not my experience mm -hmm. that's not mm -hmm. i i'm a I'm I love my life as a heterosexual when in actuality <laughs> the experience is about not about you right. it's yeah. about another person's perspective you might not even agree you might read the book and completely disagree with it but being open to reading the book on a, on a symbolic level I think is what we are what we are trying to communicate through these conversations because it yep. always comes down to well that's not my I my family didn't come from England so I'm not it's about relinquishing the sense of entitlement that I think so many settler people have mm -hmm. and giving over that sense of entitlement to a vulnerability that's saying I need to learn more about experiences that live outside my own and it might be hard it might be triggering it might make me feel like it, it's an attack but even the concept of thinking that it's an attack is is a kind of settler indoctrinized Agility. settler mentality that is mm -hmm. so far out of our own reach that it's not even a real concept so yeah. that's a fascinating thing hmm. hashtag hashtag not all white people well, Hashtag not all not all straight people. Yeah, we've talked on our media indigenous podcast about this. Settlers always accuse you of doing what they're doing, That's so they right, feel yeah. attacked. They talk about reverse racism. I got called reverse sexist a few weeks ago on oh. Twitter. Yeah, because I yeah. said this this uh, this lawyer's penis and PhD didn't make him oh. qualified to oh comment God. on the fact the field of native studies, and so I got called oh. reverse. So, but they'll always accuse you of doing what they're doing, right? Um, and so you can tell that 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 actually 
settlers, white people, straight people, straight men know what they're doing at some level. It's like when mm -hmm. indigenous people, that t-shirt, you know, with Geronimo on it, that said been fighting uh, terrorism since 1492 or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why is it that, that, that settlers always think that when indigenous people talk about land back, it means we're going to like, I don't know, put you in prison camps, steal your children and force you to go back to Europe. Oh, because you know, right. that's what you did, right? Like mm -hmm. did stuff like that. Interesting. No, no concept that it doesn't mean that. Right. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Very good. <sighs> Who else could listen to Kim all day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> listen to media and Digina. <laughs> yes, that's true. Very true. Wow. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> So how do we want to, how do we, I mean, I could literally do this for two hours, but I feel like we have to. Oh yeah. It's 2.11 already. My time is so fast. Time hey. has slipped past us in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. Well, we did say we were going to talk about TP Confessions because um, both Kim and I, uh, along with Kirsten Lindquist, are co-producers uh, for a something called TP Confessions that strives to, I guess, yeah, we strive to decolonize our bodies, talk about body sovereignty. Uh, um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the beginnings of the TP Confessions, Kim, and where it comes sure. from? Yeah, so back in 2015, we were hosting an Indigenous Masculinity Symposium at the University of Alberta, and we needed a final night's entertainment. And I had just moved from the University of Texas at Austin, and I said, hey, there's this great show in Austin called Bedpost Confessions, and I'm friends with one of the producers, and it's a sexy storytelling show. Maybe they would let us indigenize it and do it a one-off event at, uh, in Edmonton. And it went so well, and the women in Austin loved the idea that we they signed a contract with us to do an ongoing TP Confessions show, which is sexy storytelling. We've had burlesque. We've had uh, like stand-up comedy meets academic lecture. We've had an oh. onstage rope tying demonstration. Um, and then we give away oh, sex God. toys from sex toy store sponsors in between. Um, what else do we do? And then we've got um, the best part, the confessions, confessions. which are the, the stars of the show. <laughs> So the audience submits anonymous confessions and then they get read on stage by the MCs uh, and then saved for future kind of rolling PowerPoints behind future shows. And it, so it's fun. really people, people love it. Like you can tell they're nervous at the beginning of the show about their confessions. And then by intermission, they're just rolling in and people are trying to get funnier and more salacious. And I think one yeah. up each other. And by the end, we have so many confessions, we can't get through them. And it's quite mostly really funny. Um, sometimes we get really moving confessions where people talk about coming back to a place of um, sex acceptance or positivity after sexual trauma. Those are the hard ones to read, but they're, they're very important because they kind of go to why Tracy, why you got involved in this and in teaching your indigenous erotica course too, which is so moving. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the, um, so my original PhD, um, dissertation my understanding is i was working with missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and genderful folk and it was a heavy heavy topic and often in grad school right you're really isolated and it i kept right i had a whiteboard and every time a, a indigenous woman girl or a genderful person would go missing or murdered i put mm -hmm. it on the wall and it got mm -hmm. heavy and i mm -hmm. thought there has to be a balance here what is the balance with Indigenous people, because anytime you'd Google Indigenous women or sex or anything like that, it would always be violent, and negative and heavy and oppressive. So I'm like, there's something else out there. There's a balance here. And so I started looking for, I guess, dirty stories or erotic stories, something that would balance that and celebrate our sexuality, celebrate our genders. And uh, I found it. And so sort of at the time, you know, Kim had come here and I was just burgeoning onto this. It was sort of a really nice match because when we create a space like that at TP Confessions, and I'm not gonna say it's a safe space, um, sometimes it's a safer place, but cr just creating a stage and a platform for people to um, perform or speak about maybe their traumas, but also their celebrations within their you know, indigenous bodies. So it has been really beautiful. Um, and I want to go back to the confessions because something's really poignant. So I'm one of the co-MCs and then we always have like some amazing person that's reading with me. Uh, one of the confessions was actually 
my daughter, who was 24 at the time, she's sitting in the audience and I'd known the story that she had. Thanks. I knew this story and I, I got the card. So I'm reading and I'm like, oh my God, this is Bree's Bree's <laughs> confession. And it was about a picnic table, camping and not a lot of clothes. So and I'm like, <laughs> this is a mother reading her daughter, you know. You set but, yourself up for that one. That's for sure. No totally kidding. <laughs> but that's the celebration of it that I can as a mother, you know, I've taught my daughters and my son to, have that freedom you know to talk about sex and sexuality and not have these ideas of sin and shame attached to it mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know, i've always i've and always my, to paul and i've told paul this story before you know when my daughter was sort of wondering about her sexuality um she was grade four and i'm like what do you what well you can dress how you want to dress it you know it doesn't matter to me so she wore a burger king crown and a black Dracula cape for all of grade four. We'd have to go and get new crowns because they're just cardboard. I'm like, let your freak flag fly, baby. Like whatever you do have to know if you wear these things, there might be consequences to that, but I'm here to support you in whatever, however you want to be as a person. So, so yeah, you just got to let your boys uh, freak flag fly, Paul. Hell yeah, boy. Yeah. They just don't go to school naked. <laughs> no, because no. it's too cold here. <laughs> it's freezing. <laughs> like, Crazy. I mean, and, and and again, just to sort of to bring it back to to our, our to our learning, the the concept right. of a confessional, like there must have yeah. been such a, I mean, you know, to to even to say like there has to be that first person that confesses, and then you were saying that the confession started to roll in. It's so indicative of the power of creating safe spaces yes. for people to be heard and share and learn. And it's so easy to do that. And yet we're living in a society that almost is like actively trying to like snuff out those spaces mm -hmm. for people. Because if you can open those spaces for people, if you can allow that space for people to feel vulnerable and learn and share and grow, that's where power lies. Yeah. So the constant sort of cultural, you know, repression of pushing people up against a wall to be a type of, you know, one type of person or identify themselves in one specific way. It's like you mm. are eliminating the need for those sort of conversations and, and the, the need for sort of safe spaces where people can come together. I think that's, I think, you know, to this experience, to these conversations, to everything that I think Kim, you've you've been sharing with people today. I think it's all coming from such a, a, a spirited, like loving place. Yeah. And um, I think there's so many people out there that are really gonna have um, a really powerful conversation with themselves when this um, when this discussion is done because of the fact that that space was created for them to to question their own life and beliefs. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. This has nice been summer. amazing, amazing. So mm -hmm. I just want to give um, Kim the opportunity if you had any last uh, last thoughts that you want to share. I was just listening to Dan and I'm, I'm really <laughs> yeah. thankful for it's nice to be in conversation with you all and I'm grateful that I get to have this platform and, mm -hmm. you know, for, I mean, thanks to Paul and Tracy for doing this work. It's so Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Yeah. For all of every people. week. <laughs> yeah. Grateful for all of, for all of you and your voices today. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, you too, Dan. Thank you. I do have a dirty joke if you guys want to hear yes. it. Oh, that's right. This is it. <laughs> so so the, I'll try to be brief. Okay. So this happened at the script conference, which is about Métis script from the Rupert Sun Center for Métis Research at the U of A. And there was this, at this long conference about Métis dispossession and it's just heavy. And it's like all these things, three, three days. And at the end, I wasn't there, but I saw the video, this beautiful elder from Northern, from Northern Alberta, Métis, little Métis woman, beautifully dressed like Métis style, like just impeccably like made up looking fantastic and she comes up to the mic and she's like this you guys all sitting on the panel this reminds me of, of residential school and everyone's like oh my god what are you gonna talk about and she goes it was the time when the nuns taught us about sex and it was like everyone's like 
<laughs> it was like, oh my god. And she goes, and then the nun was sitting up there looking really like really awkward. And she's just looking at her lap and her hands, just staring at her hands. And she goes, Okay, women, okay, girls, when you meet with men, with boys, they're gonna they're gonna want to touch your apples. <laughs> and it was like, oh my god, are they talking about? So you really have to stop them because the next thing they want to do is is touch your peach. It was like and then inevitably they'll want them to eat your banana. <laughs> <laughs> she said that? <laughs> so, so good. Everyone like roared. <laughs> oh my Just like that. <laughs> It reminds me of Kim's grandmother in so many good ways. And my great grandmother was always impeccably dressed. Always. Mm -hmm. This is probably why I didn't own a pair of pants till I was like nine. I refused to wear anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. see, now I know how Metis she was after moving up here. Yeah. Oh, it's so cute because it has to be there. It has the fun has to be yeah, has to part be. of good relations, right? Mm -hmm. And that means pushing back against settler sexuality and all that stuff. God, I love that so much. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's my joke. Well, on that note. <laughs> that was so dirty. Um, it, it, <laughs> this was such a great, this was such a great conversation. And it was so nice to have you, Dr. Tallbear, with us you, today. Um, Dr. Tracy, Dr. Paul, uh, until next week, everyone at home, thank you for tuning in. And um, Chris Anderson. Thank you. And we will see you next week. Bye, y'all. Bye. 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 <laughs> 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 <laughs>